Hello and welcome to the Caterpillar Construction webinar series. My name is Jason Hurtis and I'll be your host for the webinar today. And our topic is in compaction or as it's referred to in the market, intelligent compaction. I'm joined by two of Caterpillar's experts in compaction today, Scott Knobloch and Lonnie Fritz. Scott, introduce yourself for us, please. Well, good morning, Jason. Good morning to you all. Thank you for dialing in this morning. Uh, I am Scott Knobloch. I am the uh, senior load and haul systems market professional for Caterpillar's GCI uh, Construction and Infrastructure Division, and also Earth Moving and Compaction Technologies, and I cover all of the Americas, uh, North, South, and Central America. So Thanks for taking here. time out of your schedule. Lonnie, a returning <laughs> webinar veteran, go ahead and introduce yourself for us, please. Hello, Jason, and thank you for having me. Hello everybody. Uh, as Jason mentioned, my name is Lonnie Fritz. I've been with Caterpillar for about four years now. Uh, before joining Caterpillar, I was a heavy highway project manager in the heavy highway construction industry uh, for some 16 years. I was born and raised in the business. Um, currently with Caterpillar, I work under Global Construction Infrastructure's marketing umbrella as a heavy construction market professional. Again, thank you for taking time to be with us today. Welcome, thank you. Again, my name is Jason Hurtis. I'm a global market professional for Caterpillar, and we're coming to you live from the Caterpillar studios in the metropolis of Peoria, Illinois. Before we get started, a couple housekeeping things. If you take a minute to look at the dashboard of the screen in front of you, in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, you'll find bios on myself as well as our two experts with our LinkedIn pages where you can contact us with additional questions. If you move to the lower left side of your screen, that's the resource section, and that's where we've put a lot of the material that the experts have brought forth um, for us today on the intelligent compaction topic. <coughs> Two things I'd like to draw your attention to in the resource section is the Caterpillar Ask an Expert. That is a web-based question portal where you can ask any type of question to Caterpillar and one of the experts will get back to you within 48 hours. The other thing I'd like to draw your attention to in the resource section is the construction newsletter. I'd encourage you to sign up for that. You'll get notifications of new products, solutions, services, and technologies from Caterpillar. Let's move over to the right side of your screen, if you will, and that's where you can type in a question. <coughs> and as you type in that question, it'll come up here on my iPad. I'll try to work it into the conversation with our experts, otherwise we're going to reserve some time at the end um, to go over the questions that you guys may have. Speaking of questions, we're also going to give you viewer poll questions. So a question is going to pop up on your screen. We'll give you a couple minutes to answer it. Um, that will help me direct the conversation with our experts and our, our topic of intelligent compaction. There'll be simple, easy questions, up, down, yes, no, left, right, not an essay. So if you quickly answer those, again, that will help us um, direct the webinar. Last but not least, if you look at the colored bar at the bottom of your screen with all the different icons, I just want to draw your attention to one of those icons, and that's the question mark button. During the webinar, if you have any problems with video or audio, please hit the question mark button. You'll be put in contact with one of our live uh, experts to work you through that problem. So what are we talking about today? Intelligent compaction. How do you get the best compaction with the lowest cost? What is intelligent compaction? What does it mean? What's it all about? Why you should consider intelligent compaction for your operation and how to choose the right system or the right method of intelligent compaction for your operation. We're going to start off with a viewer poll. So again, you're going to see a question pop up on your screen here. And the question is going to be, how much do you think pothole damage costs all U.S. drivers? Is it 40 million, 250 million, 3 billion, or $6.4 billion? Lonnie, we're talking about intelligent <laughs> compaction. Why are we talking about potholes? What, what does that have to do with compaction at all? Yeah, so great question, Jason. Uh, potholes are largely attributed to lack of compaction or failures below the actual pavement surface, that wear surface that we are traveling on. It could be hot mix asphalt, blacktop, or concrete. And kind of think of uh, the necessity of compaction and the, the results of potholes um, like your house. A foundation. Without a good foundation under your house, the superstructure will fail. The same goes for roads. Um, if we're not hitting those compaction targets, we do not have um, great quality and compaction across, let's say, the earth embankment, even the aggregate base course that is supporting that pavement structure. The failure below the pavement will cause a pothole at the surface. Okay. Our poll question's back. About 50% have picked 3 billion as well as uh, 6.4 billion, so in the Bs. <laughs> the correct answer is actually $6.4 billion or what pothole damages cost to U.S. drivers. That's a huge number. <laughs> that is huge. And that's why <laughs> compaction obviously is, is important. That's, a, that's a big number, not to mention tires, rims, cars, 
spilled coffee, everything else when you hit a pothole. Let's go ahead and dive into our first chapter, and that is what, what, I, what should I know about compaction? Um, Scott, give us the basic definition in your mind of what is compaction? What's the, what do you tell people this is basically what compaction is? Okay, thank you, Jason. Uh, compaction basically is a process of, of mechanically increasing the density of the materials by reducing the voids of the particles that make up those materials. So you just smush them together? Uh, it's pretty much uh, taking out the air water porosity. That's what we're doing, yes. And how do you smush them together? What are the forces or what do you, what's typically used to compress or improve the density? Okay, well, great question. There, is four, there are four uh, methodologies of compaction. The first one I'm going to talk about is static or what we call a preload. So if we have a site, and incidentally referring down to uh, the Mexico City Airport where we have put two meters of basalt across 10,500 acres, basically to compress that soil over a time period of year. That's called static or preloading of soil. Uh, the next methodology of compaction would be impact compaction. And that's basically all we're doing is dropping a weight from an excavator or something like that. Those would be used like on a very steep embankment where we couldn't get any self-propelled uh, equipment on or anything like that. The two we're going to kind of concentrate on today, the last two, would be uh, manipulatory, where we're using like a, tam foot comp a tamping foot compactor, and then we'd use uh, vibratory compaction. So those are the four main areas of compaction. And in your experience, what are the typical influencers of compaction? I mean, is it based on air? Is it based on material? What's Excellent it kind of question. Based on? Excellent question. The first thing I look at is we have to look at the material we're working with, what type of material we're trying to, to compact. The next most important method is what is the optimum soil content of that material? What do I have to uh, reach? What is my proctor values? And, and the biggest thing about proctor values is not so much how much density or pounds per cubic foot, but what is the moisture content that helps me receive that optimum density? Does the machine apply to that? What, I mean, whatever device you pick for compaction, does that influence it as well? Very much so. The size of the machine, the amplitude and the weight and the frequency uh, being delivered to the soil is extremely important to achieve optimum compaction. So you got to know your soil, you got to know how much moisture it currently has or how much moisture to add, and then pick the right tool to get the compaction that Very you Very much need. correct. Very much All correct. Right. Let's talk about some challenges in compaction. Um, I'm sure there are some challenges. Can you highlight what are some challenges that you've run into? Boy, I wouldn't know where to start. <laughs> I, think, uh, I, I think the first challenge I would look at is controlling the water on the oh, job site. Yeah. Not so much the top water coming down from the, from the sky, but the silent killer is the water coming up from underneath yeah. the capillary action. Yeah. And in my experience in all the years <coughs> I was in the field, Jason, um, it, it relates back to moisture again. Not only what Mother Nature's giving you, but maybe what the soil uh, moisture content is coming from a borrow site. Let's say where we're borrowing material to make an embankment. Um, Nobby has mentioned, Scott has mentioned, I should say, the uh, moisture content. You, know, you have an optimum moisture on the proctor curve. Okay, so let's say that moisture is 14.8 percent, and the spec may give you plus or minus one percent. Okay. So if we are not hitting that optimum moisture content, we're not going to receive that optimum compaction. How do we control the moisture on material? Do we have to dry it down? Do we need to add moisture? So that seems to be one of the biggest challenges, and Scott and I can mm -hmm. relate to that, and all the job sites we've been on is really trying to understand how that material responds, how it reacts to moisture, or if you need to dry it down. So you're hitting that curve just right to say hit that minimum 95% density. So again, moisture, like we say, control the water, it'll control you. Same goes for the soil, or it will control your, your density uh, outcome in your compaction test. So obviously material. What, a, what about machines, operators, any challenges or impacts on compaction from those two? Yeah, absolutely, Jason. And another great point is, yes, the operators are very influential. Um, let's say you have a nine-pass pattern to achieve optimum compaction. Um, very critical for that operator to make sure all nine passes are being, um, are being performed, as well as any overlaps and making sure you have full coverage, and we have a lot of technology that can, that can cover that for you, no mm -hmm. pun intended. All right, let's look, at, um, let's look at yesterday. We're gonna talk about intelligent compaction today, but before intelligent compaction was available, what were some of the traditional methods of, of achieving or measuring I got the right compaction on the job site? You mean how I started in the old days? <laughs> yeah, so how you started in the old days. Years ago, my <laughs> grandfather taught me the, very, very quickly uh, to do the art of compaction. I mean. I would go back and forth and back and forth, and every once in a while I'd get out and I'd pound my heel against the ground, 
and see what kind of indentation if I made in the soil. So depending on the job and depending on what was going on, if I had any indentation of the soil whatsoever, I did not achieve compaction yet. So I had to keep going. So it was yeah. basically a lot of trial and error, and if anything, over compaction. Correct, and at the same time, Jason, what I use in the field a lot and our customers do today is just visual inspection. You know, how is the tamping foot compactor standing up? Can I see air underneath the actual tamping feet? Um, you know, if I'm using a smooth drum compactor, am I seeing that soil still going down, still compressing that air out, reducing voids, and achieving compaction? So a lot of it's visual, as well as how's the equipment moving across that lift to fill maybe that you're compacting. And then dealing with the inconsistency of materials that may come at you too, that's another huge factor that Very uh, weighs challenge. in on that. Yes. Big challenge. I've heard a lot about a, a, a nuke gauge. Can you guys explain a little bit what, what's a nuke gauge, why, why is it on the job site, and what's it, yeah. what's it doing for us? Yeah, so a nuclear density gauge <coughs> is a, a gauge, a testing device that is used in the industries um, to test many different types of materials, whether it is hot mix asphalt, um, some type of an aggregate, or even a soil, such as uh, an earthen embankment, maybe a silty loam clay. Um, that device has a nuclear reactor at the end of it, hence the nuclear density gauge. Um, an asphalt, it's a backscatter test where it's on the surface, can also drill a hole for the probe. But with that, the probe has a various uh, level of settings. Let's say you're gonna take a six inch test or an eight inch test. That probe will actually inject in the soil after a pinhole is, is created um, to read into that lift and it will give you both moisture content as well as the density reading. And that is again correlated back with the proctor curve that's been established in the laboratory. They will also take a sample of the soil or of the aggregate, possibly back to the lab with them and compare that information just to make sure that the gauge is giving them proper readings. Again, back primarily to moisture and of course density. Mm -hmm. So again, it's a testing device, Jason, um, for again, measuring compaction in the field. For both soil aggregates or asphalt? Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and the key there too, Jason, is it is for all three materials and it is taken just a small area. That nuclear reactor that I mentioned earlier is only sending out a radius approximately 10 feet at very. So it, it is an indication of moisture and density for a given area that that gauge is capable of reading. So you do it every 10 feet then? You said it goes out 10 feet, so you only have to test 10 feet, or do you test 10 feet within a mile? Or how do you know, you know what, what my compaction is over yeah. here where I test it is awesome? How do I know 20 feet away that it's sure. the same? Yeah, so great question on testing frequency. That is dictated by the contract documents. The contract that the contractor has signed held obligated to that contract. So let's say you, you shall take one nuclear density test or one compaction test for every lift per thousand square yards, let's say. And again, it's specific to the contract, but it will spell out in there the frequency of testing. Again, per lift for a certain area, um, and then that is what the contractor needs to comply with on the quality control side. So accurate, but still not very accurate if you're doing a big strip of road. It's an indication. Commonly what the uh, density checker, the nuclear density checker, the geotechnical firm will look at is a representative area. If all things look consistent, it looks like it has consistency and moisture based on the color of, let's say it's soil, um, based on the rolling patterns and maybe any creases from the drum. If all things look consistent, they'll pick a random spot. Most commonly, since they're signing off on their test, um, they're gonna look for a spot that may be a little suspicious. If there is one out there, they're gonna pick a spot that may look like um, it's not as good as the rest of it, and they'll test there. Hey, if it passed here, then the rest of it should be okay. So it's still kind of trial and error, not much science, it is. other it's, than the nuclear gauge giving you some feedback. Yes, it's very random. Let's move into our next chapter, and let's talk about the value of intelligent compaction. And Scott, I know we've talked about density, density mm -hmm. and getting the right amount of density is, is one of the huge um, values of intelligent compaction. What are some other cost, productivity, anything like that factor into the value? Very much so. Cost, uh, uh, eliminating passes, guesswork. I mean, uh, intelligent compaction is something I wish I had from day one. <laughs> now that I've used it, yeah, uh, it's like, oh, how, did I, how did I compact without this before? Got tired of beating your heel in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> that improved rolling, and, and what I really got tired of, and you can probably adjust to this too, but uh, failing a lift, you know, where I think I had achieved compaction, and uh, lo and behold, I failed the uh, the troxel gauge test, and now I've got to reprocess reprocess that material and put it back down. You got to pick so, it all the way back up, or you can just keep running over it and compacting it more. 
really, Jason, it goes back to moisture again. You know, did I fail because my moisture was above optimum moisture content? And you can still pass density by having too much moisture, but you have to pass moisture and density in almost any spec that's out there. Okay, so with that, if I failed moisture, yes, I'll need to open that material back up, either by wind rolling it with a dozer, with a motor grader, bringing in a disc, needing to get to the bottom of that lift so the entire lift thickness is processed before I put it back again, before I compact it back and hope that it passes. And granted, there's drybacks and different things that can be done there, but the value um, is essentially countless. Um, reducing machine wear, reducing rework. I worked with a customer um, here in the United States that uh, saw the value of intelligent compaction just from the standpoint, and it wasn't the only advantage, but just from the standpoint of material savings. They had found a couple areas in their earth subgrade that had not met compaction. Before they put the aggregate on and had to then go through the undercut process, they were able to remediate that unsuitable subgrade at right there at that point in time then go on with the upcoming lifts of the aggregate and then on to the pavement structure. So I guess that would factor into your cost as well, not only productivity from having to mm -hmm. rework the same thing three or four yeah. times, but the cost of having to do that, the cost of mm -hmm. yeah. getting new material in there, and the cost of the operator being on the job longer, having to compact That's longer. Right, yeah. All those things would go into exactly. proving why intelligent compaction yeah. would be above Very much the so. heel test yeah. or the old new gauge Yeah, test. the three drivers in any contract, Jason, for cost are labor, material, and equipment. And it brings advantages to all three doing what? Lowering unit cost and overall cost. Okay, perfect. Let's move on. Let's move a little bit deeper into intelligent compaction. Okay. Um, and Scott, I'm aware of two basic overall technologies. Could you dive a little bit deeper sure. into the two intelligent compaction technologies for sure. us? And what are they about? What do they mean? Where do you use one? Where would okay. you use the other? Very much so. Now again, folks, intelligent compaction is a uh, feature on the machine that will basically provide the operator with an indication of soil stiffness of the lift they're working with. So uh, there's in the gauge, or in the cab, there's a gauge from zero to 150. Or uh, like on the 815, 825s, we also have a numerical value, but we also have a light bar on the bottom that will give you an indication of that soil stiffness. That does not correlate to a percent of proctor or a percent of compaction. It's just a numerical value. So you as an operator can understand uh, where I'm at as far as compacting this soil. So uh, right now there's two systems out there. The first one I'm going to talk about is called compaction meter value. This is, in short, CMV, compaction meter value. This is an accelerometer-based program that basically has two accelerometers in the drum. And so when that drum vibrator is kicked on and engaged, uh, it's going to measure the bounce back of that uh, drum through the soil, and it's going to indicate a, a level of soil stiffness. Now, the thing about CMV, number one, you have to have the drum on, okay, and uh, to measure the bounce back of the system. Number two, uh, CMV will measure to a depth a gradient of compaction of about three to four feet or one to 1.2 meters. So knowing that being said, if you're putting a first lift down and you're measuring a gradient of compaction down to about uh, three to four feet, well, you've just measured right through that 10 inch lift that you're compacting. So your numbers are gonna be relatively low. Just the other day, I was out on a customer's job site and I made a first pass, I was trying to, so. Everybody asked me, how, how, how many passes do we got to make? I don't know. It's my first day on the job. Let's find out. So what I'll do is I'll go up and back in the same pass. And so each pass, I am seeing where my CMV increases, increases to a point where it taps out and doesn't increase anymore. Well, if I keep going back and forth, I'm wasting my time, right? Okay. okay, so that helps me eliminate the number of passes right there. I cannot compact the soil anymore. Reducing cost, increasing Reducing your productivity. Everything. Mm -hmm. everything we talked about previously. So then at that point in time, I would call for uh, the uh, soil technician to come out and run me a nuke test or put the troxel gauge down mm -hmm. and see where I'm at. So just the other day, CMV, I'm measuring down there three to four feet, and I had a final compaction lever, a level of about 15. Okay, which I thought, wow, why is this so low? Well, then again, I'm measuring too deep. We come out and did a nuke test, and I was at 98% of my proctor value, a standard proctor. Yeah. So that's where I needed to be. I don't want to be like a 95. I want to just a little bit of cushion there because, again, material consistency across the job site and moisture content is everything. So then I'll have to tell you with the CMV system, give me X amount of passes and give me a CMV reading of 15 for this operator. I can be reasonably assured that when I come out to pass density, I'm going to be okay. I still have to measure density. Okay, so that's CMV. Again, accelerometer-based, measures to a gradient of compaction of about three to four feet. A lot of manufacturers have this. This system's been out there for quite some years now. It's a very good system. I like them both. 
The next system I'm going to talk about is MDP or machine drive power. Machine drive power is energy based. So it's basically reading the rolling resistance of that machine. So when you first start on a loose lift, you can have high rolling resistance and that number is going to be low. But as we start achieving compaction, that number is going to grow up and up and, and, and max out. Again, about two weeks ago, I was on a customer's job site with MDP and uh, we was demonstrating that against a machine that did not have MDP or uh, technology. And I wanted to see how many passes. This was a silty clay loam type material. And uh, I think my proctor values which should have been about 118 at a 14.2% moisture content. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I do on a loose lift, I'm running high amplitude and low frequency. High amplitude is a long stroke and a long quick stroke, short, uh, you know, uh, a long slow stroke for achieving compaction. I do two passes at high amplitude, low frequency. And I'd start feeling resonance coming back up through the machine. And I thought, okay, I need to make a change. I'd switch to low amplitude, high frequency, shorter, quicker mm -hmm. strokes, and I'm watching that MDP level. So I start off and I was about a 40. On the second pass, I come up to about an 80. And then on the third pass, I was about 110. The fourth pass, I was about 120. Fifth pass, about 121. Sixth pass, about 122. What am I doing? I'm wasting time. You're so already, you're already there. <laughs> I needed four passes. I asked the operator at the point in time, how many passes does it usually take for you to achieve compaction in this type of material with this type of moisture content? He says about eight to 10. And we did it in four to six, right there. Significant savings Significant in time, savings. fuel, right. wear and tear, everything else. Though. But understanding the difference between CMV and MDP. CMV, I like to use mainly on aggregates and once I've got a big base out there. Yeah. Once, you know, if I'm putting down several lifts and, and I've got my base up there about 36 inches or whatever, I'll kick on CMV at that point in time because that gives me a gradient of compaction down there again about that three to four feet. But one thing about CMV is you have to understand amplitude, frequency, and residence. Amplitude, again, is defined as the length of stroke. Frequency is how quick that stroke. And resonance is defined as where is this uh, vibration force is going? Are they going down into the ground? Or like most of the sites I'm going on, it's bouncing back up through the machine and we tell our operators, hey, run this thing, turn that vibrator on, don't shut it off, <laughs> yeah. over pound that ground. And that drives moisture up and everything else. Yeah, that, that's a silent killer right yeah. there. Plus it just a wear and tear on the operator and the machine. So once you understand amplitude, frequency, and resonance, then for a final proof rolling, I love to use CMV because now I can get that whole gradient compaction out there and really measure the depth of it. MDP I love for cohesive type materials, especially clays and silts. When I'm first putting that lift down there, <clears throat> it's measuring down the left, uh, depth of about 12 to 14 inches, excuse me, 12 to 14 inches. So when we come out with the Troxer gauge, where are we measuring? Usually that's six, eight, 10 inch. So it gives me a better correlation of the lift that I'm working in. Uh, as far as matching my densities Absolutely. and using both. For, now I use MDP on each lift. You can get both on each machine ordered from the factory. <laughs> and, uh, and then when I do my proof rolling, I'm going to switch over to CMV and do a final proof roll. And that's one of the questions <clears throat> that we had, and I want to reinforce that sure. real quick. They're independent. You can get CMV and MDP, or you, you can only get one or the other. No. You can get CMV and MDP, or CMV or MDP. Okay. One or the other, or both. Okay. Uh, strongly recommend ordering both out of the factory and be done with it. I'm pretty particular when it comes to compaction, <laughs> so obviously like I'm going to run both. Yeah. Uh, but if I would have to choose one, MDP is exclusive with Caterpillar. And again, it's measured more on rolling resistance. And the thing I really love about MDP is I do not have to have my drum on. And I can use it on a pad foot roller. I can use it on a smooth drum roller. So it's much more forgiving, especially for the new operator that may come out and not be, you know, a little nervous on the job yeah. site and not uh, not have all the all their A-game running yet just yet. But it's very quick for the operators to adapt and learn this system. And then once, like me, once I learned it, it's like, oh my word, why haven't I had this for a long time? You know, it's like, what have I been doing all these years? Yeah. So on our products, Jason, with the single drum vibratory, smooth drum vibratory compactor, you can get CMV or MDP okay. on the pad foot. MDP roll, measuring the rolling resistance in the tamping foot, like an 815, 825, you get the MDP, the machine drive power on that. So the technologies are similar, but they are different and specific to the machines. And that comes equipped with the machine already. Absolutely, 15, yeah. from the factory. Mm -hmm. yep. Well, anyway, we've had you on our webinars talking about grade and mapping and mm -hmm. other stuff. It, 
Talk about mapping as far as compaction and the, and the value of being able to, to map your compaction paths, if you will. Yeah. Great question, Jason. When you couple mapping together with what uh, Scott just mentioned with CMV and MDP, you have the total solution, the total compaction solution. It shall be noted that compaction sometimes is kind of looked down as the, uh, the process as it's not as critical. You know, it's, it is one of the cheapest, if not the cheapest process and the most important. What mapping provides you is several things. Um, it provides you the advantage of seeing the entire site. It shows your coverage. It shows peer-to-peer um, -peer communication. So for example, if Scott and I have each a compactor and it is a nine pass pattern and Scott has done five of those passes, Icons can be set up with various colors. Let's just go with the color scheme that we're all pretty familiar with, red, yellow, green. Uh, red will show where you haven't achieved compaction yet based on the CMV or the MDP readings. Uh, yellow, you're starting to get closer to your compaction target, and green means good. You have coverage and you have reached compaction. So it brings uniformity, it brings uniformity and quality, and it significantly drives efficiency, which is all contributed from lower fuel consumption, less rework, uh, the optimum number of passes, it all reads together. So you have the reading of the technology, do I have compaction, now it's the where. Where do I have this? Um, being uh, required by a lot of uh, Department of Transportations with the mapping, the map being provided to you, and then that information goes on to the client. Like I said, many of the Department of Transportations where they can see that machine data and the coverage that was provided by the contractor. So it stays, it just doesn't display and then once you're off that road Absolutely. or that, that no. lift, it disappears. You that, can go yeah. back and actually use that data or see that data yeah. to prove that you did get green yep. on the data, top. Data captured can be printed, can be pulled off of the machine, and is also being um, pushed to Vision Link through our product link capabilities okay. to the back office, so that data lives on for eternity. So not only the operator, but the owner, the right. site manager, Correct. the foreman can yep. see that same information yes. data. Great, let's go ahead and move into our next chapter, and I'm sure everybody's going to want to know about cost, right? <laughs> Intelligent compaction isn't free. Um, we're going to give you a couple different scenarios, and we're going to ask you to make the call, and then we'll have our experts talk about the different answers and, and how those answers would apply. So on your screen, you're going to see a, a scenario come up where we are doing a pad for a commercial processing plant. It's five acres, it's flat. Um, the soil is mainly clay loam, and we have one four-inch lift of CA6 aggregate mix, and each lift of soil must meet the 95% standard proctor uh, with a 14.8% moisture content. Fairly typical yeah, very application, standard. I'd assume, guys. Working on this very job standard. just two weeks ago. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so again, um, what phases of the job can intelligent compaction add value for this particular job? The site layout and mapping, the compaction of each lift, uh, proof rolling and mapping, or the last possible answer would be all of the above. Uh, take a couple minutes and look through that and give us your best choice on that. So this was an actual, you didn't make yes. this up, no, no, it was no, an actual no, job. It was an actual site right. that I was working on uh, just about three weeks ago. And uh, again, intelligent compaction uh, will be a very big part of this uh, project. I see it's flat, that's kind of an easy one. Yeah, I started <laughs> off easy for the folks. Uh, everybody thinks compaction is always flat, and that's not the case. I mean, <laughs> when you're building a land cell development or uh, anything like that, uh, I've been on some pretty steep grades before, and that's definitely where intelligent compaction comes in, especially I'm gonna reiterate what Lonnie talked about a little bit on the, uh, the mapping and so forth. It's so hard for a new operator to be able to back up an articulated piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. So with mapping, I can see some lemons out there or uncompacted <laughs> areas and, okay, we've got to get these green, you know, yeah. and it really is a learning aid for the operators and then uh, yeah. you as, a, as an owner and a project manager, he can rest assured now that when he pops up and looks at that screen, even from his back office, he could tell that uh, the site is pretty well compact and you don't have to worry about losing a lift. Well, our audience has replied back and they're saying, number four, all of these, that it can help with the site layout mapping, compaction of each lift, and the proof rolling and mapping. Are they right? I can't say enough about it. <laughs> exactly right. That's all right. Awesome. Right. Yes. Good job. Let's try another one. You're going to get a second situation uh, up on your screen. And this is a road to a new shopping complex, fairly typical anymore. <laughs> Um, about 1,300 feet of entrance road. This one's windy and S-shaped curve. 
So we're getting a little bit more complex oh, here. Always artistic now. <laughs> yeah, no more of the straightness. We've got to be artistic. Yeah, it's a three to one dual slope V ditch on each side of the road. Again, the same material. Uh, four 10 inch lifts of compacted uh, lifts and then one six inch lift of CA6. So a little bit more complex than our flat five acres. Here we got a grain, we got two different lifts. Um, again, go ahead and answer where you think intelligent compaction could add value. Adjust the site layout and mapping, compaction of each lift, proof rolling and mapping, or for all of these. Again, did you make this one up? Or no, or sir, I did not. <laughs> well, this is in North America. And uh, I, I have seen this, and the first thing I looked at is like, why can't we build straight roads anymore? They just got <laughs> you know, which is it's, it's a very neat project. It's a very beautiful uh, shopping center that's going in up there, and uh, it, it, it was great to be able to be up there and, and be able to advise and consult <laughs> on the job. It really was. Does compaction work on a grade or a slope? Very much so. Uh, underneath the seat, you're going to have what we call a slope sensor. So it will tell you when you're on a grade, especially with MDP, again, going off rolling resistance. Once you're on a slope, that's rolling resistance, incre increased rolling resistance. So it will compensate for that. Yep. Yep, it's all in the architecture of the machine. Our, our audience is definitely awake today because their response <laughs> is already back. And 100% of those that responded <laughs> said all of these. We must be true? doing our job. <laughs> yeah, be, it was incidental with this particular job. They had a compact, uh, the specs called for the ditches to be a certain proctor as well. Yeah. So now we're on a three to one side way. slope or four to one side slope. And, and we had to get down in there and make sure that we had good compaction. So uh, it worked out very good with intelligent compaction. Going back old school, there would have been a lot of trial of error here. Mm -hmm. A lot of worn out boot, or well, a lot of the, your boots. Yeah, or? very much so. Uh, <laughs> or proof rolling, you know. Uh, we used to always have to get down if you pass the heel test, and then we'd drive a, a fully Pretty loaded cool. uh, yeah. dump truck on there, proof rolling. Kind of hard to get that down on a four to yeah. one slope or three to one slope in a ditch to proof roll. So it was just a good example where intelligent compaction really took a lot of the pain out of the situation. You know, Scott, you bring up a good point there, proof rolling. I've walked a lot of miles following a proof roll truck just like our customers have. And that was the greatest coverage we used to have, mm -hmm. you know, back in the day. So I would have given my eye teeth to have intelligent compaction when I was in the industry. It'd take a lot of guesswork out. Well, yes, that's great. Like, let's stay on that theme a little bit. and Let's talk about the value of the investment. Um, what are... You know, what are some states doing? What are mm -hmm. they, are they adopting yeah. intelligent compaction? Are they seeing value in it? Or they still want you to nuke gauge every 20, 30 feet? What's happening, what's happening in the market and the industry? Yeah, great question um, regarding the trends. And the trend is definitely upward. Um, the Department of Transportation, as well as other developers and owners of projects are continuing to increase the adoption of intelligent compaction. Um, they're writing it in their method specs into the contractual documents, whether it be CMV, compaction meter value, or MDP, machine drive power. Um, overall, the intelligent compaction specs are being written in, like I said, as a method spec, you shall use intelligent compaction. So again, increasing adoption, they're definitely seeing the value <coughs> of intelligent compaction, soils, aggregates, all the way up to the hot mix asphalt. Um, working with a customer here in the United States, um, they, they had this uh, hit them weight square um, with their contractual documents in it calling out by the DOT they shall use intelligent compaction. And uh, I referenced them early. They, uh, earlier in the program here, they were able to save aggregate based course money because intelligent compaction showed them where they had not received mm -hmm. compaction on their subgrade. And that's something else I wanted to share with you on the mapping is they, they discovered that by seeing on their map that they had an area go green, yellow, green and they could not get the yellow area to come to green. They what knew there was something there because they were not receiving the value. In this case, it was CMV. They were not receiving the CMV value that they needed, like Scott had mentioned here in that gradient of compaction, and they knew there was an issue down there. Well, they dug it out and they found a spring. They found an issue with drainage, needed to control that water so it wasn't controlling them any longer, remediated that area, then came across with their aggregate base course and they found what? The aggregate base course not to fail. They painted the entire map green. Pavement structure goes on. What have we just eliminated? An area for pavement failure, i.e. a pothole. So could the same thing happen like a uh a buried tire or Very much anything so. like Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Uh, I, I was just thinking. <laughs> we use uh, that in a lot of training. <laughs> when we was talking about the Department of Transportation, you know, in, a, in asphalts, we've, we've seen that where we've had archive the densities uh, for X amount of years and so forth. Yes. We're starting to see more and more states come up with we need that for the soils as well. And just next week, I'm going to go out uh, to the East Coast and talk to uh, uh, Department of Transportation on the benefits uh, of uh, intelligent compaction. And one of the things I do to help train, uh, get people to adjust 
and, and with our soil technician here uh, uh, close in central Illinois the other day, uh, what we did is I went out and I buried a tire uh, in the ground to demonstrate this soft spot that you're talking about in there. And it would show up on the screen, on the, on the, uh, the GPS screen there uh, for, for mapping, and would also show up on my dash. Uh, when I'm looking at my MDP levels, I was running along at about 140, 140, and all of a sudden it dipped down to about uh, 118 and then come back up again. So I knew something was there. So in this case, I buried a tire, a big old rubber tire <laughs> off an articulated dump truck, just so you could go out and find right. the treasures yeah. and demonstrate <laughs> to you what it is. <laughs> well, you talked about the cost and associated as a, a fraction of the cost uh, uh, to get involved with in intelligent compaction. The way I address customers and owners with this is, is it, I'm going to ask you a question. In the last year, how many lifts did you lose? In other words, did you fail to meet compaction? Whether it be a housing site or a, uh, a hospital site or a road construction, whatever. And of those lifts, how much did it cost you to reprocess that lift? And I've heard answers like, well, I don't ever miss a lift, which is you know, good. I, I need to learn from you. But most common answers is, you know, I'll miss two or three lifts. One guy said I lost 10 lifts last year. I had to reprocess 10 lifts. Not uncommon. So one and I asked each other, well, what's the cost for me to reprocess that lift? Um, so I put together some numbers, and he put together some numbers. I come up with about fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 mm -hmm. just to tear up that lift, reprocess it, and put it back. For me, unfortunately, it was a real-life scenario. <laughs> okay. Uh, when I approached Lonnie, he said, well, I'm a lot higher than that. Because, you know, road construction, yeah. the nature of the beast you're working with. Depends. You know, it could, mine was a site development process, so mm -hmm. uh, road construction could be a whole lot more. Absolutely. So the cost of replacing for this one gentleman three lifts with more than double, triple, quadruple the amount. Now, I don't even I don't want to put a number. It, it, you could have bought three or four machines for uh, not just intelligent compaction, just the machine itself for the cost that that poor individual had to incur for reprocessing the lifts. And the cost is twofold, Jason. It's not only the monetary cost, trying to work within the budget of the contract, right. but it's also the schedule. Today, more than ever before, these contracts, these contractors are under expedited schedules, trying to hit and accomplish the project before the completion date when liquidated damage is set in. So if we're out there doing rework, that is only putting our schedule further behind, at least behind and causing us um, to not stay on task and on track. <laughs> So you put the lift down, and if you fail compaction, pulling that up, can you reuse that material, or do you got to bring in new let's, material let's, again? Let's talk about that right there, where I'm building a job, where I'm putting the first lift down. Let's say I get an MDP uh, value of a 135, and my CMV is, is uh, 15, just for example. And I've tapped this out. I can't get any more out of it, so I'm wasting time. So I call for quality control, and I come out, and I fail. Let's say I'm, I'm at 85% of standard mm -hmm. proctor, modified proctor, whatever X is. I've failed. So I've got to ask myself, why did I fail? Well, for me, usually a very high percentage of the time is because the soil moisture content is not where it needs to be. So I can pack it all I want. I'm not going to get there because on that proctor curve, I am less than optimum. Okay, so as long as I pound that soil and it's dry, it's just going to disperse. I am never going to compact it. On the flip side of the coin, if I get up to optimum soil content, now how do I know what optimum is when I'm on the job site? I've not got a nuke meter with me, and uh, I don't have a moisture gauge with me. Very simple. Just uh, you know, Again, my grandfather taught me this years ago. I'll gr grab a, a clump of soil, and I'll make like a softball size or a baseball size dirt clod, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I'll throw that down against my foot. That breaks up in about five to six pieces. That is close enough for optimum moisture. That'll get me in the hunt zone. If it powders, obviously I'm too dry. Huh? If it stays in one clump, obviously I'm way too wet. So I want to be at the top of that curve there, and that's very, very important. And I can tell very quickly uh, with the use of MDP and, and, and CMV where I'm at in that situation. So you may have to pull that up. You may you be might able have to rework it. it. You may have to add water, water take water out. It. And you know that optimum moisture content, Jason. So um, more scientific way, most of us had field offices have a microwave, if you have any kind of a bag, shovel, and a microwave and a scale, you take that soil sample back to the office, to the lab, wherever you're set up, dry it back. Take the initial weight, dry it back until the weight no longer changes, take the difference, and that will the difference in the weight will give you the percentage of moisture. That's called a field dry back test. Okay. And that will hone in exactly on the moisture content and say, yes, it's within the optimum, it's within the specification we are good to compact this material back. So how do you control on a job site like the weather that we're having in central Illinois? Mm -hmm. We're 
Hey, you, you laid in your aggregate yesterday, everything was perfect, you left, we got two inches of rain overnight, what do you got to do this morning? Yeah. Are you good to go or do you got to redo something? Always racing the weather. I, I always said if there was one class I wish I would have taken when I got my construction manager degree, it would have been meteorology. So we're always watching the weather. With the, To that specific question, Jason, what we're doing is one, we're achieving compaction before the storm sets in. We're sealing off that lift. We are not allowing the material to lay there like a sponge per se or lay there in its loose state. We want to get it to the compacted state. We want to take loose cubic yards and turn them into compacted cubic yards, okay? okay. Whether it be soils, aggregates, whatever the case may be, achieve compaction, have positive drainage where the water is going to run off of the fill and that's why I always had a smooth drum roller on my projects. After I slicked that material off or struck it off the motor grader or dozer, mm -hmm. Seal it off Seal with it a smooth up. drum compactor and watch the watershed. You want to eliminate the permeability, letting that water penetrate into that soil. Otherwise, if the water does get into the soil, you are going to be opening it back up and reprocessing it. And you may do that as well, but you won't need to go down to the four and six and eight inches where that moisture was able to run down into and saturate. You may be in that top inch or two that you have to reprocess per, again, the specifications. So how would you reprocess that? Strip that off and relay it and recompact it or? That is a more costly solution. What I would look at doing, Jason, is scarification or a disc and bringing that disc in, opening that material up, just like farming. Okay. Disc it open, work it, until again I do that dry back or that field test uh, to see I achieve, achieved optimum moisture, grade it off, compact it, and go about your process. Same experience? Oh, and... very much. I was, as he was talking, I was thinking <laughs> of a job site I was at uh, about a year ago down in South America. Um, it's probably a reason why I've got gray hair, and that's monitoring the weather. And so, at least you got hair left. Well, I know. I think Lyman is pulling his out all the time with all the weather processes. But um, clearly, what we fought was uh, not so much the, uh, the the water coming down from the top, the rainwater, mm -hmm. but the silent killer for them. And this was a road site uh, on the side of a mountain, so it was very critical. It was a capillary action of the water coming back up through the bottom, like and the spring with, effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much. And with intelligent compaction, again. This customer had no idea what intelligent compaction was and so forth. And once we started demonstrating this and using this and finding these soft areas, uh, was able to ward off a lot of things, uh, address a lot of issues prior to having failures, if you will, because uh, this particular road needed to be guaranteed for 20 years after date of completion. Well, unfortunately, we were in trouble already. Mm -hmm. And uh, so by finding these areas and being able to address real quickly about compaction and controlling the underwater, uh, the capillary action of the water coming back up, really saved this customer a lot of time and effort and headaches. Yeah, absolutely. So states are mandating it, both aggregate compaction as asphalt. well as asphalt compaction. And now soils. Mm -hmm. um, not everybody, but several mm -hmm. states are. Yep. You get the huge productivity increase less passes, mm -hmm. less wear and tear on the operator, less fuel burn, which also adds to your cost. You're not wasting as much material, you're not re reworking the same material three, four, or five different mm -hmm. times right. mm -hmm. using intelligent compaction. Again, which saves fuel, saves operator, and also gets you to the to the next job faster. Yep. Is that kind of the, a good summary of the value Absolutely. of intelligent compaction, yeah. or did I miss anything? I'm gonna yeah. throw in their <laughs> peace of mind. Yes. Knowing that I can go home and sleep and knowing that each lift is compacted and I've archived it. Uh, in the back office and I have all this documentation, uh, rest assured that when the quality control comes out, I can show them the map. Here's my CMV or MDP values. Here's my coverage map. They got to sign off on this project too. Yep. And yep. Uh, again, about a month ago, working with the soil technician, he says, I love coming out on, <laughs> on your jobs because I can have a peace of mind as well, knowing that we've achieved. That's what it really comes down to. It comes down to coverage, which leads to quality, which leads to longevity of the asset. We started this session. No more out, potholes. It, <laughs> I was just to say, we started this session out talking about potholes. How can we help eliminate, significantly reduce the number of potholes? It starts from that foundation. Let's have consistent coverage all the way across with re achieving compaction, driving quality and longevity, getting the biggest bang for your dollar. Any applications or areas where you would not use intelligent compaction that you could think of or in your experience? No, I can't no. think of any. I, not in I, soils, I not in no aggregates, and not in asphalt. I would not want to use intelligent compaction. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great question, but uh, boy, you're, uh, you're catching me off guard here. 
I, uh, I, I can't am so think much of anything, a, a Scott. believer of that. Yeah. And uh, I was just going to say, again, another job site that was on a couple weeks ago where we uh, were chasing each lift and mapping each lift, and we had a proof roll each lift. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was very critical. And uh, right away, we found a soft spot. Well, that's like a cavity in a tooth. If you don't address that right <laughs> off the bat, it's and true. you keep putting layers on top of that, it's going to chase you all the way up. Yeah. And by the time you come through your final proof roll, hitting CMV or whatever, getting down that uh, uh, gradient of compaction of three to four feet, well then, now we got a problem. Now we got to dig that all back up, just like it will chase you to the top and, and compact it up. So with MDP starting off with that machine drive part, getting every lift and getting a control in every lift and making sure I've got compaction, I know when I proof rolled, mm -hmm. um, this is just a icing on the cake for me. All right, perfect. With the time that we have left, um, we're, we have some questions that uh, we have not been able to answer from the audience. I've worked in several um, as we've been talking here, so okay, great. we'll spend the rest of our time trying to address some questions that, that I was not able to work into the overall conversation. Um, talk about how is your compaction system different than the one offered by others? I, I assume other OEMs or other, con, other competitors, how is okay. our Caterpillar Ours CMV MDP okay. different? Caterpillar's version of CMV is the same as all other manufacturers, okay? That's, a, again, a compaction meter value. It's accelerometer-based. Caterpillar's proprietary system, which is machine drive power, MDP, is solely based on uh, the rolling resistance of that machine, okay? So that is much different uh, than, than the CMV. And the main fact is with CMV, you have to have your vibration system engaged in order for it to work. And also, here's a big mistake I see in the field. You have to have your propulsion switch in the low gear, low speed. Do not have it in high, because CMV or MDP will not work if it's in high. It's telling you, hey, you need to be in low gear so we can get something done here and do it right. MDP, however, you do not have to have the system engaged. One or the other. It can be engaged, fine. Or if it's not engaged, that's fine as well, the vibrator. And it will always monitor the rolling resistance. And again, if I'm on a grade, I've got a slope sensor underneath the seat, I, it, will, it will compensate for me being on a grade for my readout. So there is a main difference. Um, CMV, again, measures a gradient of compaction down to three to four feet or one to 1 1.2 meters, whereas MDP is gonna measure that gradient of compaction down to about 12 to 14 inches, which is more representative of the, of the lip that we're putting down, usually in cohesive type materials, and where we're monitoring that with the uh, Troxler gauge. Okay. Uh, Lonnie, I'm gonna toss this one to you. Okay. Being a, being a previous <laughs> foreman in life, how do operators react to the addition of intelligent compaction what type of comments and feedback do you get from the operators, both po both positive and negative? Well, I um, will honestly tell you the interaction I've had with contractors and customers alike, the feedback is remarkably positive. It takes out what Scott had mentioned earlier, the guesswork. It empowers the operator to know exactly where they're at in the compaction in that proctor curve, how they are progressing through the curve and achieving compaction and they're not uh, so much concerned about have I hit the right number of passes because that value, whether it be compaction meter value or MDP, is telling them that they receive the value. When they correlate to the nuclear density gauge and say, hey, you've reached 95% density off of our gauge when you receive an MDP reading of 125. When they see they're at 125 or a little bit greater than 125, they know that part of their job has been satisfied and accomplished. Coupled again with mapping, it now shows, oh my gosh, did I go from this station here to this station here? Oh, now the stakes are gone. Yard. Did I go from this barrel to this barrel here for coverage? Uh, it not only shows them again where they've made their passes, but it also shows them their peer-to-peer -peer communication. So again, taking out the guesswork, all those uh, milestone points, if you will, on a job site to make sure they have compaction because what happens? they're already down the road or they're to the other side of the parking lot doing their exact same process when what shows up the nuclear density gauge back here oh my gosh we're not receiving compaction that's a heart sinking experience so empowering with the information again driving what the compaction the coverage therefore quality longevity it makes their job so much easier if they're out there scott mentioned about running 10 passes when you need four or five they're working themselves harder than they even really need to. Right. Maybe allow for an extra break in the day, who knows. So generally, positive comments and feedback from the operators, nobody's ever said, I don't like this, or Very this. positive. You know, with technology, Jason, you hear, oh, how am I gonna learn this technology, and this is overwhelming and what have you. Um, it's very intuitive. Mm -hmm. The technology is intuitive, both from the standpoint of the compaction technology, the CMV and the MVP, as well as the mapping. Very easy to use. 
you're drawing a picture with colors. Red, yellow, green, those are the three colors you have in your, in your cram box. Okay. So uh, very intuitive. I can't say I've ever received any pushback, Scott. No, sir, I have not either. Not either. It's, it's, when I first work with the, uh, the seasoned veterans out there, they're like, uh, well, I don't need this. I've been doing it all my life. And then once they understand it and use it, they're like, oh, my word, where have I been all my life? Let it, been? let it do the work yeah, for let's you. Go. It yeah. gives me a peace of mind. Here's another good question, Scott. Um, mm -hmm. And the question is, I currently have a roller, but I do not have uh, compaction meter value, CMV, or MDP on it. Can I get it now? Okay. So I think he's asking, he's already got a machine. Can you okay. retrofit? Is there okay. aftermarket yeah. kits, third-party kits? How okay. do you, how do you get good. the technology okay. if you don't have it today? Mm -hmm. With CMV, now let's, I'm assuming he's talking about a smooth uh, drum compactor. Uh, I'm going to address both issues for, for those. I'm going to start off with 815, 825, tamping foot. Uh, with that, with MDP, it only comes available on the K series, 815K and 825K. You, there's which no is, which is That's the, the latest, latest series. Model? That's correct, okay. right. If you had an F series or an older model, unfortunately right now we do not have a, a methodology to put MDP on that machine. And typically on a tamping foot, we would be using MDP because there's no vibrator, obviously. So now let's talk about the smooth drum rollers. If we have like a, a B series, like a CS56B 50, uh, or a, six, a 78, something like that, and if they wanted CMV to put on there, very simply call SciTech and they can come out and install CMV on that machine. That's simple. If they wanted MDP put on that particular machine, again, a B-series type machines, uh, it can be done. It's quite timely, yeah. okay? It can be done. We strongly suggest ordering it from the factory, obviously. Uh, but it can be retrofitted X factory, yes. Only on the small soil compactors, not, not on the tamping foot. Yeah. And does that, I'll, uh, they didn't ask this, but I'm sure this would be the next sure. question. There, does that include the mapping? Can that be added mapping on? Mapping is additional. I mean, you have you have the technology of, of intelligent compaction first, the MDP or CMV, and then the mapping. The two combined together, you can have one or not the other. Okay, you, you don't can. have to have both. Yep. You can have MDP or a CMV and do just fine. But you've got to be reading your screen all the time and looking at the numerical value when you throw mapping on it. So with MDP and CMV, you've taken the guesswork out of how many passes to make. With mapping, you've taken the guesswork out of your coverage. Okay. I personally wouldn't have a machine without both of them. I'm, I'm that uh, strict on that. Yeah. That uh, you know, that's what I feel. And to highlight that, Jason, it's a GNSS is what we're using the Global Navigation Satellite System. So regardless of where you're at, it's using GNSS, and then from there the SBAS or the RTK Real Time Kinematic. Okay. So if you're going to retrofit, do the mapping. Get the I, I strongly the suggest that. I really do. Uh, it's you're, you're going to pay for that in a heartbeat, and uh, contact your local dealer right away, and get in touch with them, and, uh, and make it so. You mentioned pay, and that's okay. a, another <laughs> good, good, another good question <laughs> that, that is, came in. Get is. to the money side. I'm going to try to put you. I'm going to put you guys on the spot here. Can you guys estimate or tell me what the payback period of intelligent compaction oh, technology usually is? Great, yeah, this is a good one. I mean, <laughs> take a shot at that one. Uh, uh, just from past experience, right, Jason, yeah. not only my own experience when I was like, where was this when I was out there, but also the customers I work with. Depends on the job. It does not take a job of much size at all to pay for both the intelligent compaction side and the mapping. We talked earlier about uh, redoing a lift. You know, the moisture content came in too high. How would I have known that? Well, I would have known that because I wasn't reaching compaction per se. Okay, so right there, um, consult your local dealer regarding price, but I can uh, strongly say and confidently say that uh, for the value of the intelligent compaction, the value is significantly more, again, Technology is not a cost, it's an investment, and it will definitely pay for itself time and time and time again, just from rework, material, saving warranty, fuel, unit costs, the overall cost, all those values, getting onto the project sooner. You know, asset allocation is huge. You know, do I need two compactors, one on each job, because I'm still back here at job A and I can't get onto job B? So there's a lot of value there. Um, again, back to your original question, Jason, the payback period, it varies but it's not near as long as one may think when you start looking at rework alone. I'm going to answer that from a real life scenario. <laughs> Again, uh, I'm going to pick on those poor folks that I interviewed before that uh, said they missed three lifts. One of them missed 10 lifts. 
If I miss just one lift and it costs me fifty, sixty thousand dollars to reprocess that lift, I just paid for multiple, multiple yeah. uh, investments in intelligent compaction. Even individual who uh, is a very prominent individual that I respect very highly that says he never misses a lift. You know, of course he was teasing me, but I actually believe him. He was, he was very, he's a very great contractor. Even he was purchasing intelligent compaction just for the peace of mind. Uh, so uh, yeah. for me, it's a very low cost investment uh, for, a, for an insurance policy that just is never ending. And, and take Jason, for example, just aside again, back to the real world and experiencing it myself. Take for example, the, the processing that comes before the compaction process. What you will commonly do is over process, take more time, more resources to make sure that moisture content is a little bit below optimum. You can still get density and pass moisture by being a little bit below the moisture curve optimum. 14.8, hey, let's shoot for 14.5. What do you do? You take an extra half a day, you take an extra day, and you keep working that material and working that material in hopes that when you go to compact it, you will achieve moisture and density. Well, one, we can do a dry back. But number two is get that machine out there, do you a test pass. Do you a test strip just like you do on hot mix asphalt. Run that compactor back and forth and see how that material is reacting. My goodness, guys, we are getting MDP at this. We know that correlates to this gauge reading. We have it. Go about your compaction process. And so a huge time savings, time is money. So it can be fairly quick depending Very on quick. how Very many quick. lifts you're doing, how big the job is, Absolutely. how good your operators are, how good your testing methodologies right. are. And then Nobby, as you keep uh, you're reiterating how well you want to sleep at night. <laughs> very, very much so. And yeah. I, like, I do like my sleep. But like Lonnie said, uh, when I first come out to a, a site, or even today it rained, you know, last night, things are different. Mm -hmm. Moisture changing. Within about 35, 40 seconds, I can just about tell you no. right now, we're test passing, yeah. what your MDP or CMB levels uh, should be for this today. Yeah. We test it, and we see if we pass, and we make our decision from there. Right. So very quick and very low-cost investment. We'll do one, one more question here, and it's kind of related to the, uh, the retrofit question. Um, I have a machine with intelligent compaction and a machine without. Can I move it from one to the other? And I, I think they're asking me as, he has two machines. Yeah, can, I, can I pull yeah. the accelerometers and the widgets off and put it on not, my other one? I would not advise that at all. Why? Uh, because of machine specifics and uh, a lot of... A lot of uh, a lot of work is going to have to go behind that. And again, if it's uh, depending on what size machine and what model of machine, uh, vintage, if you will, uh, it would, it's going to be much easier to order from the factory. Uh, I think time would be better spent. Yeah, and with retrofitability, like you mentioned before, Scott, with uh, accelerometer based, for the cost of the components, uh, that'd be the first thing, the time it takes to put it. But my question would be is, are you going to use, let's say, compactor A and compactor B? Are you still using compactor A and compactor B? Why are you moving it from A to B? Because again, we talked a lot about the value. It's a necessity. It should all be, uh, there should be no option. It should be okay. configured from the factory as standard. Um, and some of it is. But the point I'm making here is, is if A is still running and B is running, why have one system? You know, we understand budgets and everything like that. But again, why are we moving that? Because there's so much value. Um, again, if I was the customer, I know where I'd be going to get this purchased, mm -hmm. right, to the CFO. Um, so that would be my first question. Again, uh, the cost to just retrofit it. Um, there's a lot of variables there, Jason, as far as putting it on, getting it calibrated. Um, I would not encourage that for multiple reasons. Yeah. And let me ask this follow-up, because I'm sure this would come next. You mentioned the accelerometers and that. What about what about the mapping? Can the mapping be moved from a machine mapping to a machine? Can it or, can be. Yeah. Or I, I yeah, bought the mapping be. on the, yeah. my previous yeah. model, I'm going to buy it on a new Correct. one. Can I take the... Yeah. That's if you're going to trade in yeah. and you yeah. want to take That's off the mapping and say, hey, I would really like to use this over here on my new machine, absolutely. Yeah. It is doable. All right. Great. Thank you, guys. We're going to go ahead and wrap up this particular webinar. Again, I'd like to uh, draw your attention to the resource section, which is in the lower left-hand side of your screen. Um, two resources that I'd like to again point out to you is the Caterpillar Ask an Expert. That again is a web-based um, question portal where you can type in a question and one of the experts from Caterpillar will get back to you within 48 hours. Um, I sit on that panel, uh, Lonnie sits on that panel as well. So um, our profiles are up there in the upper left. So again, if you have other questions where you want to get a hold of our two experts, um, their information's up there. Um, last but not least in the resources, again, we'd like you to sign up for the construction newsletter. We're not going to stalk you, we're not going to chase you around, but you will get 
um, notifications of new construction technologies, new products, new services, and solutions available from Caterpillar. I'd like to thank both of you, again, for taking your time out of today um, and spending it with us talking about intelligent compaction, the value, the cost benefits, and a little bit of humor with the applications <laughs> and the experiences that you have. Well, thank you very much for having me, Jason. Thank you, folks. Thank you as well, and thank you. And for our audience, thank you for tuning in. Appreciate it. We look forward to talking to you again on another uh, Caterpillar Construction webinar series. Thank you.